Okay, let's get started. So thank you everyone for joining us on our next virtual happy hour. Um, my name is Chris Chappell. I am the Conservation and Brew Shed Program Manager over here at Washington Wild. Um, we're so excited to have you joining us to talk about the Tongas, the roadless rule, you know, what's going on, what you can do to help, um, and then how it affects us as Washingtonians. Um, so we've got a really great uh, lineup of people speaking uh, today um, and just some housekeeping. So we've got a little uh, chat um, in the Zoom. Um, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers or uh, Washington Wild staff, um, feel free to drop those in the chat throughout the program. And at the end, we'll um, get to them. Uh, cool. So we're going to start off by watching a short video about Washington Wild, and then we're going to launch into um, discussion about the Thomas. So, yeah. On a September evening in 1979, a handful of conservation activists met at the College Inn in Seattle's University District. Hours later, a new organization was born, Washington Wilderness Coalition. So I've lived in Washington State for 30 years, and it is a diverse state in that it has the Pacific Ocean, mountains, rainforests, deserts, lakes, rivers. Washington Wild is a local organization that protects all of that for all of us. And that is why I'm a proud volunteer for the Washington Wild organization. Today known as Washington Wild, over the past 40 years, the organization has led efforts to protect nearly 3 million acres of designated wilderness throughout Washington State. I'm Yvonne Krauss. I'm the executive director of the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance. We as mountain bikers have been working with Washington Wild on a very unique challenge of wanting to support wilderness and supporting that in Washington State and at the same time losing access when we do so. Um, so it's a unique challenge for us as mountain bikers. It's a very rare partnership with Washington Wild. We've been able to make that happen together, looking at wilderness boundaries, looking at trail alignments, looking at what gives us the best access for both mountain bikers and resource protection. It's rare, unique. It's been a very treasured partnership and I look forward to that partnership for 40 more years. Washington Wild brings people together in the vigorous defense of our remaining ancient forests. Free-flowing rivers, wildlife habitat, and clean air and water. My name is Brian Cladis, me chairman of the Swinomish tribe, and when Swinomish partnered with Washington Wild, we knew it was going to be a good fit to oppose this mining in the headwaters of the Skagit River, which is the only one in the lower 48 that still has every species of wild salmon still spawning in its tributaries. And in seven generations, our kids need to be standing here telling the same story to those that need to know. While much has changed over the past 40 years, our national parks, forests and other public lands are under increasing threats from unregulated mining, new dam construction, and other development. You must have good quality water to make good quality beer. Being a craft brewer and a fairly, fairly small craft brewer compared to the big breweries, we're reliant on producing a quality, consistent product. So locally, we, we try and do a lot to keep our river clean and pure. And working with Washington Wild, it just helps to expand that throughout the state to, to keep our natural resources pure. And, and as a brewery, it's just so important. Key to their success is building powerful grassroots networks and winning coalitions around protecting our public lands and wild places. The mission of Washington Wild to make sure that we preserve low uh, areas where families can have access and for salmon spawning is really critical over the coming 50 years because that's the kind of wilderness that we will be able to use for generations to come. Washington Wild does a great job that's very unique. It brings together communities, 
different partnerships to be able to establish the road to get wilderness through Congress. It's not easy to pass legislation. You have to bring people in a community together, different organizations, bring together a whole coalition of people to get the kind of energy to get legislation through Congress. That's what Washington Wild does uniquely and very well. Join me in supporting Washington Wild's leadership in protecting and defending our local wild lands and waters today and for the next 40 years. Hope you all enjoyed that video. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Tom Uniak. Hey, thanks, Chris. Hey, and welcome, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for joining us um, today. Uh, I saw a lot of familiar faces um, when I was looking earlier at who was here with us, including um, Helen Chirillo from uh, Mountaineers Books and Braided River, who um, is really connected to our presenter uh, tonight, Amy Gulick. Uh, they, she published. Um, uh, her, her couple of her books. Um, also saw um, Tim Manns um, from Skagit Audubon Society, who we work with quite a bit. It's good to see Tim there. Um, also saw a bunch of folks from Alaska and, some, uh, and all around the country and a bunch of new faces, so welcome. So as I said, I'm the executive director here at Washington Wild, and today we're gonna be talking about the Tongass National Forest, um, and you'll hear a lot about that. Um, and particularly what's going on right now, which is as a proposal to actually eliminate roadless areas in the Tongass National Forest, our largest national forest. And what that means for us here in Washington is number one, we're connected to Southeast Alaska and there are a couple of our presenters will uh, make that clear. But also um, if they can eliminate these roadless area protections, which are basically old growth forests, then um, if they can do that in, in the Tongass, um, they'll definitely be doing it here in Washington state. And that's happened, uh, they've tried that in the past. So that's why, um, two reasons why we care. Um, I'm gonna introduce a, a really, a, a, a shorter video even, um, that really lays out the roadless issue for those of you that aren't fully, um, you know, aware of what the roadless rule is. It's a really great kind of 101 video brought to us by um, our, our colleagues at Trout Unlimited Alaska, Alaska Wilderness League and Salmon State. So um, Chris, do you wanna go ahead and show that? For those of us who live in Alaska, the concept of backyard is bigger than other places. Sometimes it looks like this, or this, or maybe even this. Whatever your backyard looks like, it's where we go to hunt, fish, and recreate. Now, if you've been following the news lately, the term roadless has been a hot topic. Fundamentally, the roadless debate is about what Alaskans want their backyard to look like. But to fully explain, we need to go back in time a bit. In 2001, the roadless rule was passed to protect nearly 60 million acres of national forest from road building and industrial clear-cut logging. Now, Americans from across the country had deep connections to forest lands and pushed for these protections. But this was especially true in the Tongass National Forest of Southeast Alaska, where communities are completely surrounded by public land. You see, for nearly 50 years, industrial clear-cut logging dominated the region. But when the industry collapsed, Alaskans were left with damaged salmon streams and destroyed landscapes. So in 2001, the roadless rule was a chance for them to decide a new vision for their backyard. And the vast majority wanted to move forward with protections for their thriving salmon fishery, growing tourism industry, and way of life. But not everyone was happy. Industrial logging interests have long hoped to gain access to the ancient old growth trees living deep in the Tongass, some dating over 800 years old. But it would take removing the roadless rule to finally get their cut. Which brings us back to today. 
After Governor Dunleavy and President Trump met on Air Force One, the Forest Service released a surprising proposal that would strip over 9 million acres of roadless protections from Alaska's national forest. The supporters of this move claim this has nothing to do with logging, and the roadless rule hinders community access, critical utilities, and renewable energy projects. But the roadless rule already allows for projects like these. In fact, since the roadless rule was placed in the Tongass, all 57 requests for projects, ranging from hydroelectric developments to community infrastructure needs, have been granted by the Forest Service. What the roadless rule does prevent is industrial clear-cut logging. This is why the people of Southeast Alaska, tribes in the region, businesses, and visitors have almost unanimously supported roadless protections in the Tongass. They want a stunning backyard that provides billions of dollars to the economy, sustainable jobs, and hunting and fishing opportunities for generations to come. So this is what roadless is all about. Today, industrial logging interests are pushing to remove a decades-old protection, despite continued overwhelming local support. The people of the region have spoken, but it will take voices from across Alaska and beyond to save the roadless rule. Thanks. So that's a really great little, a great primer. Um, I want to introduce our first speaker tonight, um, who is somebody um, who is part of uh, Washington's um, Brewshed Alliance, which is a um, kind of a, a network that we put together of craft brewers around Washington State um, who um, care about clean water. And the reason they care about clean water is because um, beer is 90% water and where their beer comes from is usually places that we're trying to protect. And many of these places are actually national forest roadless areas, the headwaters that um, supply our municipal drinking water and supply water to breweries. And so um, breweries totally get uh, uh, where their ingredients come from. And um, Jack Lamb is, is one of those. He's the CEO of Aslan Brewing, who uh, you guys, many may know, has a, um, a really prominent brewery in um, Bellingham and has just opened up uh, another um, location here in Seattle. Um, Jack's been a really strong supporter of Washington Wild's work and a great member of the Washington Brewshed Alliance. So um, with that, I'll let Jack talk about um, why roadless areas matter to him. Jack? Awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was an honor. Um, uh, we've always been fans of Washington Wild. Um, the fact that you started this Brew Shed Alliance and had such awesome um, support and great businesses really care about what you guys do. I mean, um, it's bringing a whole industry together. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, we've been a massive supporter of protecting the environment just from day one. Um, you know, I'm a, I am a born and raised Pacific Northwesterner um, and I don't really want to go anywhere. I want my family to be raised here. I want future generations to be raised here and I want it to look like what I got to experience growing up. Um, you know, when you talk about clean water for beer, it absolutely is huge. Um, we, you know, there's projects actually that were going to affect um, even our, our uh, uh, specific drinking supply. And again, if that has changed, I mean, our entire product, our entire research and development, everything changes um, and um, quality goes down. Um, but that's just a small part of why we support Washington Wild, why we think it is massively important to be um, protecting these forests and these waterways. It's because of the greater Pacific Northwest um, prosperity. Um, as you know, really this pandemic has shown, if you really hurt a part of our community, even just a piece of it, um, it starts this kind of dominoes effect. Um, so, you know, we ourselves as workers at breweries are avid recreationers. Uh, we fish, we mountain bike, we love our outdoors. In fact, we need our outdoors and, in, 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 you know, uh, for us to be sane when we come to work and we're working inside and working with all the stainless steel and all this stuff. But also it's, it's such a huge draw 
for the well-being of our entire community um, and for those coming and visiting our community. Now, if our land turns into, um, you know, this damaged um, arid land, I mean, what is the appeal of coming here and, and, and um, uh, being able to give people the experience uh, that we are able to? Um, so I think it's a larger thing other than just water and beer. Um, it's everything. Uh, I, I'm super happy to see Joel here from Nurka Salmon uh, because that is exactly the point. Uh, we have a, a restaurant up in, in Bellingham and we rely on quality local salmon, uh, well, local fishermen to go grab that salmon out of Alaska and, and for that to continue to um, be um, something that we want to uh, give our, our, our customers without feeling like we're depleting something. So um, all of these special things in life, you know, beer is special, food is special, hospitality is a very special uh, treat that people look forward to and I think keeps us going through dark times. And um, if we can make sure that the place in which we live and where we source a lot of our ingredients stay clean, then I think that um, many businesses, our entire industry depends on it. All right, right on. Hey, Jack, thanks. Well said. Um, appreciate you um, spending some time with us tonight. So we're going we're gonna to stay in Bellingham, and uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Joel, Pre Joel Brady Power, as, as Jack referenced. Um, and Joel's a really um, compelling person. He, uh, he and his wife, Tella Addison, who is also with us tonight, um, just watching tonight, um, they uh, they uh, own uh, Nurka Sea Frozen Salmon and and Etta Bellingham, and they have a commercial fishing permit up in Southeast Alaska, which is just off the coast of the Tongass. And as Amy, uh, our presenter, will will make very clear to us all, um, there are is no salmon without the forests, and so the Tongass is directly related to the to the fish that they catch and and sell here in Bellingham, as as Jack um, pointed out. Um, Joel is also um, more than a fisherman; he's a he's a He's a poet, um, uh, and um, we're really happy to have him. Both him and Tella wrote a really compelling um, op-ed in the Everett Herald um, in December when this was uh, uh, this proposal first was proposed um, in December of last year. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to, to Joel, who's going to share some thoughts with us. Joel, take it away. OK. You got me? You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. At the heart, it's water. Where the rivers like veins flow from the glaciers and swell when it rains. Providing safe passage for salmon not slain from the ocean's embrace to the streams whence they came. To spawn and to die, but their bodies remain to fertilize the forest, rising up from the banks. I would like to thank Tom for having us all here and all of you for participating with us tonight. Um, I'm a second generation commercial salmon fisherman. I've spent every summer of my life from the time I was two weeks old in Southeast Alaska, like Tom said, in the waters of the Tongass. Um, when I was 22, I bought the boat that I grew up on from my dad and my partner, Tella, and I have been running it for the past 16 years. And we spend our winters in Bellingham marketing all of our catch to food co-ops and restaurants and anyone committed to sustainable salmon, like, like Jack at Nauslan, who we've had the privilege of working with for the past four years now. Um, we like to say that we tell a sea to plate story told with love. We love wild salmon. We love the wild spaces they live in. We love the ways our lives get to intersect with theirs. And with that love comes responsibility. We're proud to work in a hook and line fishery that's managed for conservation. We're literally catching every fish one at a time. The most inefficient fishery in the world, but that's great, but also Responsibly managed fisheries alone aren't a measure or guarantee of sustainable salmon. 
The salmon can't speak for themselves. The forest can't speak for herself. And as the forest helps sustain salmon, salmon sustain me. Salmon have given me a life, a livelihood, and an identity. I owe my life to salmon. Salmon give their lives so that this story may live on. And as you'll, like you'll hear from Amy later on, when they die, they literally feed the forest that in turn nurtures their young. It's all connected. There is no sustainable salmon without a healthy Tongass. And these lands belong to all of us. So I'm just asking everybody here today to please join us and help us in the fight to keep them safe and intact. Because I think like Tom alluded to earlier, it's not gonna stop there. So we really need to work to preserve our wild spaces. Thank you. All right, hey, thanks, Joel. Glad you could join us today. So um, first, I just wanna do a quick shout out. I think I saw Jim Young on, on, uh, on the call here, who um, if it's the same Jim Young, I think it is, is a former board member of Washington Wild, so welcome. Um, but I want to introduce our the main event here. Um, we're so uh, blessed and happy to have Amy Gulick here. She is a uh, author, photographer, and an award-winning photographer at that. Um, she, her photos have um, been in outdoor photography and several other publications. Um, she um, is probably best known for just an incredible uh, book that she put out uh, over a decade ago called Salmon in the Trees. Um, Life in Alaska's Tongass um, Rainforest, which is very appropriate to what we're talking about right now. Um, she's going to share a presentation with us that um, I'm really excited for. Um, and, you know, again, um, as we as we listen to Amy um, walk through this, um, again, what is happening right now, and the reason we're, we're kind of educating folks about it, is that, you know, the Trump Administration Forest Service is um, pushing forward this proposal to eliminate 9 million acres of roadless, roadless areas in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. Um, that's every acre of roadless areas. So it's the most extreme proposal there could be. And um, right now they're working to finalize that. They haven't listened to the comments that happened over a year ago, which were overwhelmingly against this. There will be a legal strategy to actually um, push back if they finalize this rule. There's also a fair question about, depending on the election coming up, about what administration will be handling this. And that's the thing about roadless areas is that they're administrative protections. So unfortunately, if you get a, a president in the White House that doesn't care about salmon or you know uh, old growth forests, then it's unfortunately remarkably easy to kind of uh, rewrite these things. So trying to make as much noise as possible um, about this, and you'll have an opportunity in the chat to kind of take an action uh, during the call or afterwards. So with that, I um, want to introduce Amy Golick and i um, really uh, excited to um, listen to her presentation. Amy, the floor is yours. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in tonight. Um, I appreciate it. I love talking about one of my favorite places on the planet, which is the Tongass uh, in Southeast Alaska. I'm speaking to you tonight uh, from the ancestral homelands of the Snohomish, Tulalip, and Coast Salish people on a beautiful Woodby Island in Washington's uh, Puget Sound. So as a photographer and writer, I'm always on the lookout for interesting stories. And a while back, I read an article somewhere that talked about this remarkable connection between the salmon and forests um, in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. And it was such a bizarre concept, this, this idea that there are salmon in the trees um, that I knew I had to go there, I had to see this for myself. And so off I went for several years and I came back and I created my book, Salmon in the Trees, so that um, others could see it too. So I'm going to share my screen here so we can all see it. Um, here. Get rid of everything else that was on my screen. All right. Okay, Chris, can you see that? Yeah, looks great. Okay, great. So where to begin this crazy quest uh, for salmon in the trees? 
Well, at the start, all I knew was that I needed to go to Alaska. Now, Alaska is by far our largest state. It's more than twice the size of Texas, the second largest state. And most of us tend to think that all of Alaska looks something like this, but where I needed to go was the rainforest of Alaska. Now, I always thought that rainforests were in warm places near the equator. Well, those are tropical rainforests, also called jungles. The rainforest of Alaska is a coastal temperate rainforest, and this is one of the rarest ecosystems on the planet. Now, most of Alaska's rainforest is in southeast Alaska. This is also known as the panhandle of the state or sometimes called the Inside Passage. Almost 90% of southeast Alaska is the Tongass National Forest. So anywhere on the map where you see a shade of green, that is the Tongass. So this is a place where the forest meets the sea. So clouds slam up against this jagged coast range uh, that separates Alaska and British Columbia on the mainland. And this creates lots of rain, more than 200 inches a year in some places. It's why extra tough rubber boots are an essential part of every southeast Alaskan's wardrobe. Even the babies here are extra tough. Now, much of the Tongass is spread out over 5,000 islands in the Alexander Archipelago. And so no point on land is far from the sea. And at times, this line is blurred between where the forest ends and the sea begins. So you'll see things here like bears digging for clams on the beaches, marbled murelets. This is a seabird that nests high in the trees and feeds in the ocean. Humpback whales cruise right along the forested shorelines. And Animals like ravens and river otters carry mussels and clams from the beaches into the forest. So it's 17 million acres. This is about the size of the state of West Virginia. The Tongass is by far our country's largest national forest. About 70,000 people live in this part of Alaska, but because of all the islands and the rugged mountains on the mainland, the most reliable modes of transportation here are boats. So this is Creek Street in the community of Ketchikan. Uh, this is the Alaska State Ferry. And in addition to boats, seaplanes act as taxis. So where do I start and how to get around in this island in, of uh, jagged peaks? Well, I decided to do something that I didn't really want to do, and that was fly in a small plane with the door off. Now, don't let that smile fool you. It is one of madness and not joy. I thought maybe if I close my eyes, it might not be so bad, but that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of doing this. So, I did this because I wanted to get a big picture view of this immense region. And from the air, it's really easy to see that the Tongass is a giant mosaic of very different landscapes. And while the Tongass is a national forest, only about 60% is actually forested. The rest is rock, ice, wetlands, more than 20,000 lakes and ponds, and 40,000 miles of streams. So during the last ice age, parts of Southeast Alaska were covered in ice. And glaciers have played a, a really large role in sculpting the Tongass into what we all see today. So all of the straits and inlets of the Inside Passage of Southeast Alaska, these are glacial fjords and are gouged by the Pleistocene glaciers. So when the glaciers receded, then salt water then flooded these valleys. So what do glaciers have to do with salmon in the trees? Well, when the glaciers retreated, some new occupants then moved in. Things like seeds, spores, bugs, shrubs, birds, beavers, trees, deer, wolves, fish, bears, and people. And the forest was born. So in this forest lives one of the world's highest densities of brown bears, uh, also called grizzlies, and as well as the highest density of black bears in the world. And the forests are quite thick, so it's not like you can see a bear coming a mile away. Sometimes you can't even see a bear coming a few footsteps away. And bears can swim uh, in the rivers, the streams, uh, they even swim in the ocean. Never far from the forest, the sea is loaded with large creatures, creatures as well, including uh, stellar sea lions, uh, dolls, porpoises, and orcas, uh, also called killer whales. For sheer size though, nothing beats the humpback whale. So humpbacks migrate to this area every spring, traveling thousands of miles from their birthing grounds in places like Hawaii to dine on the smorgasbord of herring and small shrimp called krill. Sometimes the whales employ a technique called bubble net feeding. This is where they spiral upward, blowing a curtain of bubbles that then confuses and corrals their prey. They then burst through the surface, scooping up the lassoed rewards. So do I travel here by land or by sea? Well, both. It's how the native people lived for thousands of years. And today, people's lives are very much tied to both. 
So the Tongass is traditionally Tlingit Indian territory and in more recent times home to some Haida and Simchian people as well. So all native peoples of this area, they traditionally located their villages just above high tide line. So with clams, seaweed, gumbu chitons and other food sources right out their front door, uh, the native folks have a saying. They say when the tide is out, the table is set. Since time immemorial, the sea has been an important food source for the first peoples of the Tongass and very much continues to be so today. Now, these are two young men uh, filleting a halibut and these are uh, community uh, members of the village of Cake uh, preparing uh, smoked seal meat in the foreground there and dried and smoked salmon uh, in the background. So in addition to the sea, the forest is important too for things like berries and medicinal plants and trees for totem poles, longhouses, uh, and for weaving materials. Now it's no surprise that the artworks, dances, and oral histories of the native folks in the Tongass region are rich with stories of people and creatures like salmon, bears, and whales transforming into one another. Clans like killer whale, frog, and wolf speak to the importance of both land and sea. So in the native cultures, the family lines follow the mother and people belong to one of two major groups uh, known as moieties. So in this part of the world, you are either eagle or you are raven. So I had the honor of spending time with many native people who allowed me a glimpse into their culture. So in the village of Klawak on Prince of Wales Island, I spent time in John Rowan Jr.'s carving shed. John is Clinket Eagle of the Shank Whitey Wolf Clan. He's also a United States Marine and a native arts teacher instructing students in carving, language, oral history, and dancing. And in addition to teaching the next generation of kids, John is overseeing the, the carving of the third generation of totem poles for his village. Carving next to him is 15-year-old Noelle Demert. She's Clinket Eagle of the Cogwan Tan Clan, and she's the lead carver on this totem pole. And I was honored to attend the pole raising ceremony for the pole that Noelle uh, helped carve under John's watchful eye. This is an occasion of great celebration where the people dress in their clan regalia and perform traditional dances and songs. And no celebration like this would be complete without a feast, including salmon, one of the most important food sources for the native cultures and a very important part of the economy uh, for many people uh, in the region. So where there are salmon fishermen, I'm hoping that there might be salmon. So I hook up with uh, Carl Jordan. Carl's a fourth generation Alaskan salmon fisherman out of Sitka on Baranoff Island. And Carl tells me he's proud to catch what he considers the best food in the world. His commute aboard his 38 foot trolling boat takes him past forested islands and breaching whales. And he looks for seabirds feeding on herring. This is a good sign that salmon may be present. Weather, tides, water temperatures, uh, all of these things guide his decisions. And he knows he's part of an intricate web. And Carl is typical of many fishermen in the Tongass region. Uh, and just like you heard from uh, Joel as well, Joel's also a troller. Um, and I think most of us are surprised to learn um, that it's small mom and pop operators like Carl, like Joel, um, that deliver the best food in the world to our grocery stores and our restaurants. So Carl tells me that he's thankful for the salmon because they provide for his family and they do all of us who eat them this awesome service by nourishing our bodies. And then he says something that makes my head spin. He says that when the salmon swim into the forest, they nourish the trees too. Could this be salmon in the trees? I thank him, I jump off his boat and I head back to land. So when you go looking for salmon in streams, uh, you will almost certainly see bears as well, whether you want to or not. So on Admiralty Island, it'd be highly unusual not to see bears, and that's where I was headed. So the Tlingit people call this island Kutsnawu, which translates into Fortress of the Bears. It's an appropriate name as Admiralty has one of the highest densities of brown bears in the world, an average of nearly one bear per square mile. So the second you step foot on Admiralty Island, all that really matters is the present. You're in someone else's home, someone a lot bigger and stronger than you, and it'd be nice to return to your own home at some point. So you're on your very best behavior. You announce yourself, you're considerate, you're super clean with your food, you give your host, particularly the lady of her house and, and, and her offspring, plenty of personal space. Now, if you do all of these things, you'll likely have a pleasant visit, perhaps extraordinary. So the mouth of Pat Creek on Admiralty Island, this is a beautiful example of a rich estuary. This is a place where freshwater streams empty into protected bays of the coastline. So an estuary is in a constant state of flux as the tides ebb and flow. 
Biologically, estuaries are highly productive areas supporting a rich mix of both terrestrial and marine life. Now, when I visited Admiralty Island in early August, salmon were leaving the ocean and entering the estuary. And sure enough, there were plenty of bears waiting for them. Now, there's nothing like watching bears being bears in their home. So I'm watching the bears here because the salmon are here. But why are the salmon here? Well, salmon are remarkable creatures. So they're born in freshwater streams and rivers. They head out to the oceans to mature. And then somehow, at just the right time, they find their way back thousands of miles to their birth streams as adults to then spawn the next generation. So the Tonga supports all five species of Pacific salmon. And every summer and fall, millions of wild salmon fill the nearly 5,000 spawning streams in the Tongas. This is the time of year when the whole place comes alive. Where there's a concentration of food, the crowds show up. Not unlike a Friday night, all you can eat buffet. So the great numbers of salmon help to explain why the Tongass region supports the world's highest nesting density of bald eagles and why there are 80 bears here for every one bear found inland far from salmon streams. Now to watch this feeding frenzy has got to be one of the greatest spectacles on our planet. So more than 50 species in Alaska have been documented feeding on salmon. Uh, black bears, brown bears, uh, all kinds of birds, uh, marine mammals, uh, including seals uh, and orcas, um, and people. I know I eagerly await the salmon's return. But even more astounding, though, is that enough salmon dodge the deadly obstacle course of the beaks and jaws of animals, as well as the nets and hooks of people, to sustain their populations year after year. And they've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. So while there's a lot of action going on at the mouths of the salmon streams and in the estuaries, I noticed that many salmon make it past this gateway between ocean and land and they keep swimming upstream into the forest. So that black, uh, dark black blob there in the lower left corner, that's all salmon. And this is a very common sight uh, in these um, thousands of salmon streams throughout the Tongass uh, at a certain time of year. But um, so they're headed upstream and I want to know where they go. And so to do this, um, I head over to Wrangell Island uh, where I meet up uh, with Brenda Schwartz-Jager. So Brenda's fourth generation Alaskan and her ancestors worked as bounty hunters, trappers and big game guides. And Brenda tells me that she's the first generation in her family to be able to bring people to the Tongass uh, and not take anything other than photographs. So Brenda says that in society today, you know, we're, we're all used to pushing a button and, and we control our scenery, um, our temperature, and even our sound. But in a real wilderness, she says, we quickly realize that we're not in control and it's humbling. And probably no other place Brenda goes that allows people to experience wild Alaska and be humbled is a place called Annan Creek. So off we go, zooming over the water in her boat. So we moor the boat at the mouth of the creek and we enter the forest on foot. It's mid-August and the place is thrumming with life as gobs of salmon make their way upstream. So the harpy screams of ravens like emanate from the forest, uh, bald eagles swoop from treetop to rock top, eyeballing the feast before them. Hordes of Bonaparte gulls descend upon the stream, scooping up salmon eggs. About a mile into the forest, the stream is pinched by a series of waterfalls and the salmon are jammed up. So it's here where the bears gather for this all-you-can-eat buffet. Now, the bears are wary of one another, but they tolerate somewhat uh, each other's presence because the food supply is so plentiful. But there's definitely a hierarchy and the bigger the bear, the better the fishing spot. The place is literally crawling with bears and there's so much going on that I don't know where to point my camera. So I try to focus on the bears fishing. When another bear uh, jumps onto the viewing platform, this interrupts my concentration, forces me to move back. Uh, still another bear passes just a few feet behind me. And yet another bear hangs above me. So I kind of start scratching my head and I'm asking, you know, who's watching whom? You know, am I watching the bears? The bear's watching me. I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, at some point, though, I try to ignore the bears, which is difficult, um, but I really want to focus on the salmon here. So fin to fin, tail to tail, they sway against the current as one giant mob. And I forget that they're individual fish until one springs from the crowd, hurling itself against this foaming wall of water. And then another, and another. And this goes on for hours, days, weeks. But for the salmon, every minute is precious as their time is coming to an end. 
they've stopped eating. They're in their final act, spawning, and they won't stop pushing upstream until they die. It's a testament to the power of that biological clock. Passing on their genes is their mission in life, and once accomplished, they pay for it with their lives. After spawning, they die. So I always like to say, if you're a salmon, there's no such thing as safe sex. You spawn, you die. I'm now surrounded by death, but in death, there is life. And as I contemplate the life cycle of these incredible fish, a bear zooms up a tree with a salmon in its mouth. Could this be salmon in the trees? Well, technically, this is salmon up a tree. So how the heck does salmon get in the trees? Well, away from the creek, I spot a fresh salmon with a bite taken out of it, dragged and dropped into the forest. And suddenly, the thing I'd been searching for was staring me in the face, and it all made perfect sense. The salmon, bears, trees, soil, bugs, roots, berries, birds, and the bees was all right here in this glorious cycle of life, one of the greatest shows on earth, and one that plays out all over the Tongass every year. So here's the deal. Scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon stream. This variant, it's called nitrogen 15, and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there in the bodies of salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But how does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Now, bears don't really like being around other bears, so when they catch a fish, they will often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. Turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in just eight hours. Now, toward the end of a good salmon season, the bears can afford to be picky, and they usually target the richest parts of the fish, and they leave the rest behind. Other animals then scavenge on these carcass, carcasses, and this spreads the nutrients farther throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer decomposes into the soil, and the trees and other vegetation absorb it through their roots. Scientists have actually traced nitrogen-15 in trees near salmon streams that they can link directly back to the fish. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. Now, not to be outdone, the trees return the favor by nurturing the salmon. Trees shade the spawning streams. This keeps water temperatures cool for the developing fish egg. Their roots help stabilize the stream banks. This prevents erosion from fouling the clean water and gravel beds that the salmon need to lay their eggs. And fallen trees create protected pools and provide food for insects that then feed the young salmon. So in parts of the Tongass, Trees help grow salmon and salmon help grow trees. When you understand this connection, you can't help but start to see other connections. Bald eagles fueled by salmon will soar greater distances to find food during the lean winter months. Female bears padded with fat reserves will give birth in their dens and nurse their tiny cubs with salmon and rich milk. The forest fertilized with supercharged soil from decayed fish will sprout new growth come spring. And the salmon? Well, as winter arrives, the last of the adult salmon are spawned out and their nutrient-packed bodies picked clean. Swaddled in the streams and incubated by the forest, their fertilized eggs will soon hatch the next generation, ensuring that the cycle of life is a circle, always flowing, never broken. So in the Tongass, what goes around comes around. And that goes for us too. Salmon help us understand that we also need healthy forests and oceans for the gifts of clean water, air, and food. So what's the threat to the Tongass? Well, it's helpful to know a little history. When Russians and Europeans arrived on these forested shores in the 1700s, they saw a land of superabundance and they started taking things. They started taking things in great quantities, things like gold, sea otter furs, whale oil, and salmon. Now we were a little slow to start taking timber here in great quantities, but that all changed after World War II. Industrial scale logging began in earnest and some of the great forests of the Tongass began to fall. Thousands of miles of logging roads and clear cuts have degraded parts of the Tongass, impacting some salmon streams and the people and wildlife who rely on them. Now keep in mind that as big as the Tongass is, 17 million acres, 40% is not forested. It's rock, ice, and wetlands. And 30% of the Tongass contains what are called productive old growth forests with commercial timber value and less than 3% of the entire Tongass consists of what are called big tree productive old growth forests. These are among the areas most valuable to wildlife, including salmon and the people who rely on them. So while these forests are best known for their centuries old giants, they are in fact multi-aged or ageless forests. And I'll explain what I mean by this. 
So when a giant falls, like this one did here, probably snapped off uh, on its own in a windstorm, this creates a gap in the canopy and this allows light to reach the forest floor and stimulate new growth. So saplings and shrubs all sprout and clamor for the sky. All ages and sizes of trees eventually create a multi-storied canopy. And in a forest like this, in death, there is life. A fallen tree becomes a nurse log and its decay provides nutrients for new trees. A standing dead snag, this provides homes and lookout spots for all kinds of critters. And the feast that the forest provides nourishes many different animals. Uh, this is Devil's Club and it's large clumps of berries. This is an important food source for bears and Devil's Club is one of the most important medicinal plants uh, to the native people. Bunchberry, this is a critical food source for the Sitka black-tailed deer, particularly in the winter months. And the deer, in turn, is an important food source for wolves, bears, and many local people. So what happens after all the trees are removed from one of these forests? Well, there is a lot of new growth at first, but this doesn't last long. In a relatively short amount of time, just a few decades or so, the even-aged trees that grow up create a closed canopy, and this shades out any understory plants. So this forest was clear cut about 70 years ago and biologically it's a desert. There's no food for wildlife, particularly the deer. And there are many parts of the Tongass that now look like this. And scientists have determined that the forest will persist in this state for several centuries before it begins to develop the complex structural characteristics of a productive old growth forest again. So while trees are renewable, an old growth forest in this part of the world is not, not on any kind of human time frame. So of North America's original coastal temperate rainforest, which once extended intact from South Central Alaska to Northern California, 44% has been affected in some way by urban development, logging, or farming. Um, and most of this has taken place from Vancouver Island and British Columbia South. So anything you see in red uh, has been developed uh, in some way, and those original forests uh, are now gone. But here's the good news. The Tongass is located here, and enough critical areas are still intact holding the ecological integrity of the whole place together. All of the species that existed at the time of European settlement are still here. Nothing is missing. Brown bears wiped out in the most of the lower 48 states live here in some of the highest densities in the world, due in part to all of those healthy wild salmon runs, which in turn support other species, as well as a viable fishing industry that's been certified as one of the world's best examples of a sustainable fishery. Humpback whales find enough to eat to fuel their long migrations. The native people still live where their ancestors have since time immemorial. And all the local people here enjoy a very special way of life. And visitors come here because there's no other place like it on the planet. Now, some of the most biologically critical areas of the Tongass uh, are not protected. And threats to them, as you've heard, uh, include things like continued logging, uh, mining, industrial scale tourism, uh, climate change, and who knows what else down the road. But despite these threats, I have hope. I think that we can get it right in the Tongass simply because there's still time to do so, and we know that it's the right thing to do. So let us learn from the lessons that Salmon in the Trees teach us, that everything is connected, that this most magnificent of rainforest thrives because all of its pieces still exist, and that we are a part of this all too. Now globally, coastal temperate rainforests are rare, covering just one thousandth of the Earth's land surface. The Tongass contains a third of the world's old growth temperate rainforest and the largest reserves of intact old growth forests left in our country. And it's ranked among the top 10 national forests in the United States for its ability to store carbon and regulate global climate. So it's not just important for the people who live here, it's important for all of us worldwide. So as you can see, we've been given a great gift and an even greater responsibility. The Tongass is public land. It's entrusted to all of us. As Americans, we all have a say. And it's my greatest hope that the Tongass will always be a place where there are salmon in the trees. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> that was a really, really inspiring presentation. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think that it really drives home the point of why we need to protect this, this, you know, incredible pristine wilderness area. Um, so I want to point out that in the chat, uh, 
uh, my coworker Tara dropped a link to a um, action alert, wawwild.org slash save the Tongas. So if you click that link and go there and fill out a form, um, you can be able to send a note to the head of the Forest Service and the head of the USDA supporting, you know, keeping the real visual intact in the Tonga. Um, so now uh, we are going to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions for Amy um, or anyone else that's spoken, feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, but to kind of start it off, Amy, I was wondering if there was a, uh, a experience with wildlife in the Tongass that really sticks out to you as, as special. I'm sure there were many, but if there's one that comes to mind first, uh, it'd be great to hear about that. Yeah, um, there are many. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to narrow it down, but I think the one that the one that really sticks out to me the most, um, you know, again, I, and I think you saw from some of the photos, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on, on salmon streams when the salmon are spawning. So, you know, they've left the ocean, they're now coming home, you know, to their birth streams. And just because you have thousands and thousands of salmon right in front of you, it's still really difficult to make photographs that, that translate into that. So I spent a lot of time trying to do that. And, um, and so there's one day I was on a stream and again, just loaded with salmon. And, you know, it's, you've got one eye, you know, in the viewfinder, the camera and your other eyes kind of open in the periphery and you're always looking out for bears. Um, because they're always going to be there, you know, whether they're kind of lurking in the forest or they come charging into the stream. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm always on the lookout for that. And um, so one day there were a few bears around and, and then they all kind of disappeared. I'm like, okay, great. I've got a few minutes here. I can focus on the salmon. And so again, I you know, got my face up to the viewfinder and I'm looking through the viewfinder. And for some reason, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a sound. It wasn't motion, but I just felt like there was something something else next to me. And, and I looked up and a bear had very quietly you know, come down to the stream and was very close to me. And um, you know, a little too close for me to uh, really kind of do a whole lot at that point. Um, and so I was trying to be calm and you know, keep my cool. And, but what I realized is like the bear was paying no attention to me and the bear was pretty much doing the exact same thing I was doing, which was focusing very intently on the salmon. And, I always kind of say it took me standing shoulder to shoulder with a bear to make me realize that that we're all a part of this incredible you know cycle of life that's going on. I think as a photographer, I've always felt a little separated from it, like I'm just witnessing everything that's going on. But it, it um, uh, having that bear stand you know, next to me, I just realized it's like I, I'm a part of this too. So that's that's one of my favorite stories. That sounds incredible. Wow, uh, what a fascinating encounter. Um, so I don't see any more uh, questions. So I think we'll wrap it up here, but you know, I wanna uh, give- hey, a... hey, Chris. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. I, 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 did, I think I did see one question in the chat and I'll, I'll go ahead and try to answer that, which is basically like, so what What are our options with what the, what's being proposed here? Um, which is that, you know, the Trump administration's not listening to, um, you know, the millions of people who do not want roadless areas to be um, undone. And I think the question had to do with, could an Ab a Biden administration, depending on the election, you know, kind of provide some recourse. And so I think there are a, a number of options that, um, that we have uh, that go beyond just the Trump administration listening, which isn't happening and isn't likely to happen. And that's why we're trying to make as much noise right now as we can. The first is, is that indeed, because this is administrative protection, that if, um, you know, uh, um, there was a President Biden in, in 20, 2021, um, that that would be very relevant. Um, you know, that, that that's the administration that would have to move forward with this proposal. And, um, you know, uh, I think this is a very extreme one. The, the second thing is, is that there is something called the Congressional Review Act, which was used extensively by the last Congress to undo a number of Obama regulations having to do with protecting clean water, um, with um, more input on our Bureau of Land Management lands, um, and all kinds of things. And it, it, depending on the election, a new Congress next year could use that Congressional Review Act to vote against and undo this type of regulation. So that is another option. A third option that we will have is that we can look to um, making these administrative protections law. 
And our own Senator Maria Cantwell has been a strong advocate for ever since she's been here um, to actually have a leg piece of legislation that would actually make these uh, rules um, law. And that bill has about 101 co-sponsors right now in Congress, which isn't enough yet to, to kind of get it to pass in the House. But I think the more um, we make it clear that people support roadless areas and the Tongass, um, the, the more that number can go up. Um, the last thing that is always an option and will be pursued is that if this regulation is finalized, um, there are really talented lawyers like Earth Justice and others that will uh, pose legal challenges to this rule. And there is, um, you know, a, a chance that, the, that that will get overturned in court. In fact, when the Bush administration had, had uh, attacked roadless areas, that's exactly what, what did happen. So we have a number of options, um, despite the fact that um, the current administration is not listening to um, what either people in Alaska or around the country want for these incredible forests. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, do you want to add anything about it, whether or not the Tongass would, would uh, uh, there's any roadless area in the Tongass that would be large enough to qualify as a wilderness area? Oh, well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the roadless areas are administratively protected. And I think that, you know, these are areas that have wilderness qualities. Um, and so uh, wilderness is a, a legislative designation that Congress, you know, can make and um, does provide kind of the strongest level of protection on our federal lands. Uh, designating wilderness requires a, a very uh, long process of, of local support. Uh, it takes years to, to accomplish that. Um, we've been fortunate enough to do that here in Washington State a couple times. So it will require a lot of local support and political support in Alaska, which sometimes can be, um, you know, challenging. Um, but from a wilderness quality perspective, these lands are wilderness quality. Um, but we need to make sure we retain these administrative protections because getting wilderness can can be a, um, sometimes a tough, a tough climb. It takes a lot of time and effort um, as, as we and others you know, know well. Awesome, thanks for that rundown, Tom. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up now um, unless anyone has any last minute quick questions. But uh, yeah, I wanna give a huge thank you to Amy, Jack and Joel for speaking with us. Um, all of your, your talks and Amy's presentation were, you know, really inspiring. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm sure we'll be doing another one of these virtual happy hours soon. So stay tuned to our social media and your emails. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your evenings. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>